and also to learn about accuracy, accuracy and precision. Do you know the difference between accuracy and precision? You are very good. You are very good. You probably haven't heard it, but uh, it's usually depicted with a sort of uh, a dart board where people throw darts at. And in terms of accuracy, we compare data. Compares data with external reference <coughs> whereas precision compares the data with itself. with itself. And just to illustrate what so what we do is here we basically look at people throwing darts and <coughs> What we see here, for example, in this case, oops, the data are very precise. We compare them to itself, the data. They are very close to each other. But they are quite away from the bullseye. Yeah? So precise, if we compare the data with itself, but not accurate, because they are away from the external reference point. That makes sense. Yeah? Now, let's talk about precision. So, precision. And that is when we compare the data with itself, and also we try <coughs> to make sense of the data. What do the data actually tell us? As scientists, we do experiments all the time. We ask questions. That is what a scientist does. For example, the question would be, is there a God? Is a legitimate question. Millions of people have tried to answer this question before. <coughs> okay, the data are a little bit inconclusive. Another question could be, does this drug actually work to fight cancer? It's another question. So we do experiments. We get data from these experiments. And now we have to make sense of these data. I have done experiments for about 30 years. And very often you will discover that you and your experiment are talking different languages. Just to give you an example, your question is, Is this black or is it white? Just metaphorically speaking. Is it black or is it white? And the experiment gives you the answer, 11. And you think, hmm, something went wrong here. 
either I don't understand what the experiment tells me, <coughs> or I asked the wrong question, or I completely screwed up. As a scientist, please be aware that 90% of your experiments go straight into the bin. It's not that you get the Eureka experiment every single day with every single experiment. Very often, you just simply F it totally up. And that's all right, because FAIL stands for First Attempt in Learning. And if you fail, you do it again. So fail is a good thing, unless you're doing parachuting. <coughs> so don't fail. So precision. Let's talk about precision. Let's talk about how we can <coughs> actually visualize data. And the first thing that we do is very often we sum up the data. <coughs> so this is called measure of central tendency. <coughs> central tendency. And you, all, you have all done that. It basically says, how can we combine different measurements? And because I'm a total foodie, I've got my quality street here. Now, what we can say is, yeah, we have different chocolates here, right? Stop salivating. <laughs> and, for example, what we can do with this chocolate, we can measure how much each bit of chocolate weighs. Yeah? And we can say, right, we've got the chocolate. And a measure of central tendency in terms of weight would be the average. Okay? So we could calculate the average of these seven and say the average weight of our chocolate is, I've got only six left. And this has done something very interesting. Does it still work? Yeah. I've got only, th uh, I've got seven, so let's do the, the mean of it. And usually we abbreviate the mean as with an X bar. That's the mean. Or average. Okay? And we can very easily calculate it. Everybody knows how to calculate the average. We just simply <coughs> sum up, that's the symbol for sum, our individual xi, our individual weights, and divide it by the number of observations that we have. That's usually written like that. Okay, so, let's say I weigh my chocolates and I find the following. In grams, one, <coughs> two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, these are the different grams of my chocolates. Can you please calculate the mean? What's the mean? 
Four? Who said that? Four? Let's see how precise I am. <laughs> that might be actually you. accuracy. You're welcome. So the mean is four. Uh, before you stuff your face, how did you do it? You added them all up. So we have one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six plus seven. That gives us? 28. Equals 28. And for x bar, we have 28 divided by 7, and that is 4. Absolutely right. Now you can eat it here. Easy, isn't it? You've done that since year dot. Now there is a slight problem with this way of calculation. The mean is incredibly sensitive to what is called outliers. So for example, got another chocolate here. I now have one, two, three, four, five, six, 329. <laughs> I'm not repeating what you just said, right? Okay, what's the mean? 50. 50, who said? Good man. Do you play cricket? No. Oh, you should. So the mean is 50. You see the problem with the mean in this case. <coughs> There's one data point which may or may not be rogue, which completely screws it up. And the mean is incredibly sensitive to that. But there is hope for us. We can use a different measure of te uh, central tendency which is called the median. The median is basically, we order the data in ascending or descending order. It doesn't matter. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <coughs> and we just simply take the middle value of that. A very easy way of doing that is you just simply tick things off at either end. 1 and 7, 2 and 6, 3 and 5. Ah, this is our median. That's the one that's left. Yeah? Make sense? Is the median sensitive to outliers? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5... 6, 329. 1, <coughs> 2, we still have the same median. <coughs> so the median is not sensitive to outliers. Now, in this case, you had it quite good because it was an odd number of data points. 1, 2, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <coughs> ha! What do we do now? So it would be, what did you say? <coughs> yeah, you said? It's four and a half. Four and a half. Is he right? Yeah. Okay, good. So because it is halfway through. Yeah? And this actually means, when we talk about the mean, or the median, rather, 50% of the data are smaller than the mean. 50% are smaller than the median, and 50% are larger than the median. That makes sense? Yeah? 
Okay, so that's a good starting point. Right. So we've done the measure of central tendency, but sometimes it's also good to know how much our data are actually, how much are the data spread out? And this is called <coughs> measure of, I have to look it up again. Measure of dispersion. <coughs> okay. We can use the two different approaches uh, for the measure of dispersion. We said, in one case, we use the mean. <coughs> and in this case, when we start from the mean, which was our x bar, what we can do is we just simply measure how far the individual measurements are away from the mean. So... This would be, if we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, we can say, OK, our mean was 4. So the first one, how far is this away from the mean? Well, 1 minus 4. Yeah? For the second one, 2 minus 4. Third one, 3 minus 4. 4 minus 4. 5 minus 4. 6 minus 4. And 7 minus 4. Right, and then we could say, for example, let's add it all up. Yeah? What would you get if you add this all up? Who said? Zero. Zero. Oh, damn it. Because zero indicates that there is no spread. But we know that there's a spread. What can we do? <coughs> Who was that? Do you want a chocolate? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a question, eh? Good man, you just dropped it at the end, but that was all right. Huh? I my phone. You dropped your phone? <laughs> man, get your priorities right, huh? If I give you two more, can I have your phone? Uh, no. Oh, he got it right, the priorities. Okay, the suggestion was to square it. Well, actually, why is it zero? Because these numbers actually eliminate each other. You have got negative numbers in this range and positive numbers in this range, and they cancel each other out. But if we square it, and add them up. It's a completely different story. True? <coughs> because then the negative becomes a positive. And in this case, what do we get? We get 28. And then we just simply say, OK, we just measure it with how many observations we have. Have I done a mistake? No, why can't you use modulus for the negative number? You could, actually, you could do a modulus, if people know what it is. 
But sometimes your calculators have a problem with that. Yeah? So, what we've just done is we have tried to calculate what is called the variance. Variance is a measure of dispersion, and it tells us how stretched out the data are. And the equation for the variance is we sum up everything, we measure how far our individual measurement is from the mean and square it, and then divide it by. And here comes the problem. <coughs> it depends on what we are looking at. And I will go back to that in one of the lectures shortly before Christmas. We can either look at a sample or at a population variance. And there are slight differences. For the sample variance, we divide by n minus 1. And why this is, I tell you shortly before Christmas. At the moment, just simply accept sample is n minus 1, where the, whereas when we look at the population variance, we divide by n. So let me spell that out again and do it properly. Sample variance... equals the sum of <coughs> the deviations from the square of the sums divided by n minus 1. <coughs> Population variance equals sum of the squares of the deviation divided by n. And there's almost a sort of a philosophical explanation why there is a difference between n minus 1 and n. Now, if you look at the units of these things, so we said, for example, we measured our x, our, the weight of our chocolate in grams, what would be the unit of a sample variance or a population variance? Well, because we square everything, it would be unit squared. Yeah? And a lot of people don't like that because you have basically, say, four grams that was our... Um, our mean, and uh, four grams squared for the variance, 28 divided by 7. And people don't like that. So what they've introduced is, hey, let's get rid of this square. How do you get rid of a square? Square root, exactly. That's not worth a chocolate. That was too simple. <laughs> and this has another name. This is called the standard deviation. <laughs> and, of course, we can have a sample standard deviation or a population standard deviation. In the case of a sample, it's abbreviated with an S. In the case of a population, it is indicated with the Greek sigma S. So S 
is the square root of the variance of a sample. Sigma is the square root of variance of the population. And this is quite common, actually, that people use a standard deviation. What happens to the unit in this case? Sorry? It's gone back to grams. So we now have, if we have here our population variance, we have 4 gram, and the standard deviation, and I abbreviate that as STDEF, it does not stand for sexually transmitted disease evolving or something like that. It stands for standard deviation. And that's actually the abbreviation <laughs> that you find in, uh, for example, Excel and spreadsheets. And I'll show you how you can do that, how you can do very easy calculations with Excel. So we have here 4 gram, and the standard deviation is square root of 4 gram square, which is? <laughs> two grams. So this standard deviation and the variance tell us how far spread out the data are. Makes sense, if you know what it actually means. <clears throat> Quick question. Is the standard deviation susceptible to outliers? Yes or yes? Yes? You're absolutely right. You get a chocolate afterwards. Come to the front later. It is, subse <laughs> it is susceptible to outliers because the mean is susceptible to outliers. So the standard deviation is slightly problematic because there could be an error in it. Huh. What can we do? Well, we said the median is not affected so much by outliers. Can we do the similar thing for the median? <coughs> so we have... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We said that is the median here. One thing that we can easily do when we look at these data, we can calculate the range of our data. The range is very simple. It is the largest minus the smallest. So in this case, 7 minus 1 equals 6. That tells us how far spread out the data are. That's already a good starting point. We can do more with that. We can say, OK, the median is this one here. Now, let's take the median of these data here, of the one that are before the median. What's the median before the median? That would be the first quartile, yes. I come back to that. In, in terms of numbers? Loud? Two. That's the median of the first part. What's the median of the second part? Six. Yeah? Now, some people might disagree with that. And that is because I sort of uh, tricked you into saying, okay, I look at 
these data here and I exclude this one that I've already done. Yeah? Some people take offense <coughs> with that. So they would calculate for the second part, we include the fee 4, so it would be 2.5. Both ways are correct, although they lead to slightly different results. But in principle, they are correct. I prefer the exclusion. I don't like it with the inclusion of the, of the second part. Yeah? Anyway, what we have here is, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And what we can do now is we can summarize the data in what is called a box and whisker plot. Please don't say whiskers plot. That outs you as a cat lover. Uh, it's whiskers, and I'll tell you why. So what we do is we have our mean here, our median here, sorry. That's the first bit of information. We have our second one and our third one here. And what we do is we just simply combine them, and we have a nice box. Yeah? <coughs> What do we do with the one? Well, we say it goes up to here and it goes up to here. And these are actually, these bits here, these are the whiskers. Whereas here is the box, a box plot. And here is our median. Now, what we see is that we have divided that into four segments. One, two, three, and the fourth segment. So here would be the end of the first segment, and that is called the first quartile. This here, of course, is the second quartile, and I abbreviate it. This is the third, and that is the fourth quartile. And quartile just simply means one-fourth. So this is a typical box and whisker plot. The range is all of it. <coughs> well, you can get more from that. We can also get what is called the interquartile range. And the interquartile range is usually abbreviated as IQR, interquartile range. And that is the third minus the first quartile. And in our case, it would be 6 minus 2 equals 4. So the IQR of that is 4. It's a bit weird. It's the median. It's the mean. It's the IQR. But it doesn't have to be the same thing. It's just by, by accident. Yeah? So that's the IQR. Now, here's a question for you. One, two, three, four, five, six, eleven. What's the IQR? Still four, right? Is it still four? Oh, oh. <coughs> no. Is it still four? 
Four? Yeah? IQR is still four. Yes, you are absolutely right. Trust your, trust your calculation. So IQR is still four. Why? We have our median here. We have two here. Six. Yeah? What do we do with this 11? Is 11 sort of an outlier? Do we have a rope measurement here? Is it an outlier? You say yes. Could be. Now, this allows us actually to calculate outliers. Because the conventional wisdom is, or the definition is, an outlier is either uh, smaller than the first quartile minus 1.5 times IQR, or it is larger than the third quartile plus 1.5 times IQR. So, what's 1.5 times IQR? Six. Six. So the first was 2. So 2 minus 6 equals minus 4. So anything that's smaller than minus 4 is an outlier. And the third, that was 6, plus 6 is 12. Anything larger than 12 is an outlier. Is our 11 an outlier? No. So it could happen, this outlier. Yeah? Or it could happen that we measure that, and we would say it's not an outlier. So we would probably draw it like that. And what you see is that the whiskers are asymmetric. Well, that's fine. They don't have to be symmetric. Yeah? So that's another way of showing the data with a box and whisker plot. You get it? And you can construct it. It's pretty straightforward, I would say. So sometimes we were talking about precision. <coughs> this is when we compare the data internally and when we visualize the data internally. If you've got only three measurements, you can do very easily a mean. You can do a standard deviation. You can do a variance. It's very easy. Can you do a box and whisker plot with three? Ah, you need probably seven data points. <laughs> so although the box and whisker plot tells you more about the data, with three data points, usually it's not that good. It's not that powerful. So that's precision. Let's talk about the accuracy. <coughs> With the accuracy, we compare our data <coughs> with external reference point. <coughs> OK? 
Okay? So, for example, you see in your practical, somebody uh, spoke to me about that earlier, you see <coughs> measured data that is what you measure, and expected data. So that is basically the true data. That is what you should get for your measurements. Well, what we want to do with the accuracy is we want to compare that. But of course, we need to know what is the expected data. Where is our bullseye? I can throw my sweets, my darts, as much as I like. If I don't know where the bullseye is, it could be terribly precise, absolutely spot on precision. But if I don't know where the bullseye is, accuracy? Bugger it, right? Doesn't mean anything in this case. So how do I find that? In our case, with the expected data, we could, in theory, if somebody had bothered, we could look up, with a, for example, with an equation, a, a, a equation we could look up what is the expected reading when we do this nitrophenol experiment? And then compare our data that we get with the published data, for example. I doubt that somebody had done exactly this, this, the same experiment with the same spectrophotometers, with the same solutions, with the same cuvettes, on the same day, with the moon in the right position on a Tuesday being slightly hungover. It's probably not going to happen. So how do we find this expected value? We could ask somebody who is very, very experienced to actually do this experiment. Ask somebody to repeat this experiment and give us a value. But maybe, you know, they had a bad day, or they are still stoned, or God knows what. So do we have confidence in that, what they tell us? Mm, maybe not. But there could be another way. What we actually could do is, we could say, right, we do this experiment. Oh, cool. <coughs> we do this experiment. A lot of other people do this experiment. And hopefully, not everybody is stoned or pissed or had a rough night or has no idea how to operate the pipette. So what we can do is we can actually ask, let's say, nine other people <coughs> ask nine other people what they get in terms of results. And everybody will probably get a different result. But if we take the mean of these other means that they get, <coughs> hopefully we will be close to the true, the expected mean. 
of course, there is a certain factor element of not being right, but in a way, that's life. That happens all the time when we take measurements. So that is something where you say, this is how we can find out the expected value, and we can compare our data. Now, with the expected value, we've got nine different measurements. And again, we can do a box and whisker plot like that. And then, with these nine uh, measurements, we can say, OK, our measurement is, let's say, here. So actually, it is within the right range. So we are probably reasonably accurate with that. I will show you, shortly before Christmas, a different way how we can deal with that. But for the time being, this is how we can measure whether we are on the right track. On the other hand, if we are out here, this indicates that we are probably an outlier and way out. One last thing. One thing that I forgot to mention when we talk about the spread of things, there is another thing which is called the standard error standard error of the mean it's often abbreviated as SEM it's not scanning electron microscope in this case it's also abbreviated as S uh, X bar and this standard error of the mean is defined as the standard deviation. And here, that's the sample. Sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of observations. So that's the standard error of the mean. And there are a few nifty things that you can do with the SEM which I will show you in a different lecture. Any questions? Go in peace. And have a wonderful weekend.